Hello and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project litigation update on Ohio versus the Environmental Protection Agency. My name is Sarah Bankson and I am the Associate Director of the Regulatory Transparency Project here at the Federalist Society. Today, January 24th, 2023, we are pleased to have with us an excellent panel of intellectually diverse legal experts who will discuss this case pending before the DC Circuit. Before we begin, I will introduce our panelists and our moderator, and after the discussion, we will have an opportunity for audience Q&A, so please enter any questions you have into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. With that, I will first introduce Jonathan Brightbill, partner at Winston and Strawn LLP. He works in the firm's litigation and white collar, regulatory defense, and investigations practices. He served as Acting Assistant Attorney General of the United States Department of Justice. There, he led the Environment and Natural Resources Division, and he worked on the Trump administration's One National Standards Rule. John, thank you so much for being here today. Next, we have Professor Robert Percival, the Robert F. Stanton Professor of Law at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law. He's also the Director of the Environmental Law Program at the University. He previously served as senior attorney for the Environmental Defense Fund, and he is an author of more than 100 publications on environmental law, federalism, presidential powers, regulatory policy, and legal history. He's also the principal author of an environmental law casebook titled Environmental Regulation, Law, Science, and Policy. Professor, thank you for being with us today. Our moderator for today's discussion is Dr. Sohan Dasgupta, partner at Taft. He practices litigation, investigations, regulatory and compliance matters, and international disputes. He served as Deputy General Counsel of the United States Department of Homeland Security and Special Counsel of the United States Department of Education. He's also an adjunct law professor at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. Sohan, thank you for being here and for moderating today. Now there's a lot more to say about each of these individuals, but in the interest of time, I'll stop there you can read their full bios at regproject.org. Finally, a note that as always, all expressions of opinion on today's program are those of the speakers. Thank you all for joining. And with that, Sohan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sarah. Really appreciate the uh, generous words and uh, your uh, most helpful and illuminating introduction. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Sohan Das Gupta, and I'm delighted to moderate today's litigation update with our distinguished panelists, Mr. Jonathan Brightbill, former Acting Assistant Attorney General of the United States and uh, currently a partner at Winston and & Strawn, and with um, Professor Robert Percival of the University of Maryland School of Law. Uh, I would like to uh, mention at the outset uh, the Federalist Society's mission statement. The Federalist Society exists to promote the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, uh, the separation of powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be, a la Marbury versus Madison. This litigation update concerns Ohio versus uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, which denotes a challenge to uh, the EPA's reinstatement of the waiver allowing California to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from motor vehicles. The uh, EPA rescinded the Safer Affordable Fuel Efficient Vehicles Rule Part 1, one national program, SAFE 1, that uh, Sarah uh, alluded to Jonathan having worked on, and reinstated a waiver of uh, the Clean Air Act preemption for California's greenhouse gas, GHG standards, and zero emission vehicle ZEV sales mandate. These are just some aspects of California's advanced clean car program, ACCP. A three judge panel of the DC circuit will hear oral argument in September of this year. Judges Millet, Rao and Childs uh, will hear arguments um, in this case. Uh, and we will later on get into uh, predictions from our panelists about where this case is headed, what the implications are, and so on and so forth. Uh, in full candor, yours truly filed an equal sovereignty and clear statement rule related amicus brief on behalf of 11 amici, um, ba basically arguing that the Constitution's federalism principles, most notably equal sovereignty that the Supreme Court has been 
uh, has been um, uh, addressing and sharpening uh, over the last very, last several decades, most notably in Shelby County versus Holder, are uh, directly implicated in this case. And also making the point in this amicus brief that Congress has not authorized the EPA to grant this waiver. In fact, it has precluded the issu issuance of this waiver um, through the Clean Air Act and the Energy Policy and Conservation Act of uh, 1975. In the absence of a clear statement from Congress, the EPA's reinstatement of this waiver uh, because of uh, because it unsettles a established federal state balance and concerns a matter of vast economic and political significance uh, uh, under West Virginia versus EPA um, that this waiver should be invalidated. Uh, I would now like to turn it over to uh, Jonathan Brightbill, who will discuss the issues and uh, uh, facets of this case, and we will then go to uh, Professor Percival, and uh, we will let the discussion. Um, proceed and develop organically. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan, Turn it, turning it over to you now. Great, well, thank you, Sohan, and thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting this discussion and inviting me to participate. And it's also a pleasure to do another panel discussion uh, with the Federalist Society with Dr. Percival. We always have very uh, enjoyable and spirited discussions, uh, Bob. So, uh, uh, so, you know, growing up in Pennsylvania, rural Pennsylvania in the 1980s, uh, there was no greater treat on a sick day from home than sitting around and getting to watch daytime television, right? Hogan's Heroes and Gilligan's Island reruns, Hollywood Squares. But of course, the best was always The Price is Right at 11 a.m. on CBS. And I'm old enough to remember Johnny Olson, the original announcer before uh, for Bob Barker, before Rod Roddy uh, took over. And the high point of every single Price is Right was, of course, when somebody got a chance to play for a new car, right? Now, even at a young age, it struck me that the new car always featured, among other things that they talked about, California emissions. And I, I, I noticed that as a kid, and I always wondered what it meant. But little did I, or I imagine most other non-Californians then appreciate that the significance of that feature comes from an extremely complex legal history about what and why California itself gets its own emissions. Uh, and nor could I then imagine as a kid in the 1980s that the debate about California emissions and California's authority to set emission standards would rage for decades more, and it has. The latest round, as we're here to talk about today is the case styled Ohio v. EPA. Uh, and it is in some respects the flip side of a case that's currently held in abeyance, which would, uh, which would have challenged the Trump administration's rule, the one national standard rule, which included both a, a, a rulemaking by the Department of Transportation's National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, as well as the uh, the waiver adjudication, uh, as EPA has styled it, uh, that is at issue in Ohio v. EPA. The EPA, NHTSA, have gone back during the, this administration and reconsidered what was done during the Trump administration. And now uh, we have, in effect, the flip side of the litigation that was uh, begun during the Trump administration. Uh, in full disclosure, I was rep representing the United States in that case, but I'm no longer representing a party in any of the current litigation. So my discussion points today are based on public information uh, about the current litigation. Now, the lead petitioner in this case is the state of Ohio, which had intervened in the prior case, which I, I gather is actually still in abeyance, but prior case in the DC circuit. And it, along with a number of other states, are opposed to what they see as California setting, or at a very least dramatically influence, influencing national regulatory policy regarding emission standards for automobiles, uh, and in effect, pushing the nation towards electric vehicles. They're joined by quite a number of private petitioners, uh, as they have styled themselves, which is a mix of trade associations and individual companies uh, who uh, are opposed to the desire to replace and electrify America's voter motor vehicle fleet and support infrastructure 
based on the internal combustion engine with one that would be for the uh, electric vehicles. So with respect to the California waiver, the DC circuit precedents challenging California's authority and, ca and challenging ex California's execution of that waiver um, go back to the 1970s. Nevertheless, in Ohio v. EPA, the DC circuit, uh, at least first, is going to get to grapple with more than your standard array of statutory and administrative law issues. In the wake of their uh, success in the Supreme Court in West Virginia v. EPA and the recognition of the long uh, simmering but now recognized major questions doctrine, the collection of states um, and many of the same states as, as were collected for West Virginia v. EPA uh, has return to see if they can make uh, more law to further restrain the, uh, the administrative state. And by that, uh, they are putting forth, as Sohan referenced in his introduction, an affirmative constitutional challenge to the Clean Air Act's structure, asserting that the 1967 provision that uh, in the words of the United States, in their uh, response to the petitioner's brief, grandfathered uh, California's existing automobile emissions program um, and allowed that program to continue. Uh, but that provision has not only grandfathered the existing program, uh, but then has since gone on to allow it to expand uh, beyond the scope of what it was in 1967. Uh, and the state's Petitioners in particular are advancing the argument that this violates the constitutional equal sovereignty doctrine, um, which requires that states be uh, in the in the arguments of the of the petitioner states uh, be treated as equals at least uh, and not be regulated as states, but that the federal government maintain itself as regulating the people. Um, and that any uh, dis differential impact uh, be as a result of um, what I'll call a non-political differentiation uh, between and among the states. So this latest round of litigation um, stems from the California decision in the mid 2000s to begin regulating greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles. Prior to that, they had had a zero emission vehicle mandate going back to the 1990s. Um, and uh, they were even then um, seeking to have a transition to electric vehicles in California to address uh, smog and NOx and other conventional pollutants. But uh, in the mid uh, 2000s, they began to then develop and justify and support a additional program requirement based on uh, trying to address greenhouse gas emissions. Now, that ran into uh, really two statutory issues. One was actually the Clean Air Act itself, which uh, states that in 209A of the Clean Air Act, that the there will be one federal national standard. And uh, initially at that point, when California first moved ahead with a greenhouse gas emission standard, um, that 209A applied. Uh, secondarily, it also uh, allegedly ran afoul of the uh, Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975, which is a provision which Congress established and established a, a program for regulating fuel economy of automobiles and created a cap A standard, a cor corporate average fuel economy standard um, that required the various car companies um, to meet a, an, an average metric across their various vehicles. Interestingly, the CAFE program from its inception measured the fuel economy of vehicles um, by actually uh, measuring the carbon dioxide emissions that were generated by virtue of the combustion of gasoline in the vehicle and uh, by a mathematical uh, conversion 
than determining what the fuel economy of, view, of the vehicle was. So in effect, uh, you have a situation where you can state a fuel economy standard either as miles per gallon or, um, but the reality is that miles per gallon standard has always been based off of a measurement of carbon dioxide uh, emissions over a uh, stated period of time. So uh, the, uh, the OEMs, the automakers uh, at that time um, brought challenges as well, asserting that the California program was preempted under the EPCA statute. The Bush administration initially denied a request that was made by California under 209B of the Clean Air Act, and which is the provision now that will be central to the Ohio v. EPA case, at least on the statutory arguments. Um, this provision, as I earlier mentioned, gave a uh, ostensibly, uh, facially at least neutral in a sense, stated that, quote, any state which has adopted standards other than crankcase emission standards for the control of emissions from new motor vehicles or new motor vehicle engines prior to March 30th, 1966, any such state could receive a waiver of the preemption provision in 209A. Um, and nevertheless, and it bears emphasis, and of course, this is one of the, the arguments of the petitioners, there is and was and will be for all time only one state in the union that meets that requirement, and that is the state of California. Um, indeed, years later, as there were uh, changes to this provision and other provisions of the Clean Air Act uh, were uh, added, which uh, continued to expand the authority of California to obtain Clean Air Act waivers. Uh, some of the later provisions, Congress actually then stopped with the, the, uh, the, the idea of uh, March 30th, 1966 in any state and just uh, went directly to naming the state of California in those, um, in those provisions. So the primary issues then presented will be um, whether or not Congress can permissibly permit one state, but not others, as a political entity to exercise powers or to have exemptions from federal powers and regulations that it is not Grand, granting to others. In effect, can Congress pick favors? Can it regulate states as states? Secondarily, then, the second primary challenge uh, from a statutory perspective is whether or not the uh, act, the Clean Air Act uh, provision uh, in uh, aside, uh, whether or not the California waiver would and California program would violate the Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975, which the petitioners contend the EPA is required to consider when it is itself doing an analysis of whether to grant California a waiver. There, on, there are also a number of what I will call more record-based challenges. Uh, the uh, private petitioners in their brief uh, have argued that the 209B waiver is one that must be undertaken, the analysis must be undertaken on a kind of standard by standard basis. The United States takes the position that the waiver is granted on a whole program, programmatic basis. And, but uh, if you take the waiver on a kind of standard by standard basis, the, the petitioners, the private petitioners, uh, take uh, are of the view that the EPA has failed to justify the 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 waiver uh, because the waiver can only be granted where there are uh, compelling and extraordinary conditions uh, and where California has demonstrated that it quote needs out quote the waiver to address those conditions and the contention is made that California has failed to make the record showing that there is a need for a greenhouse gas emission standard uh, because California uh, and EPA uh, cannot in effect demonstrate that the uh, standard that they are putting into place is one that will actually do anything to address 
the uh, climate impacts that were identified um, as a, a justification uh, for the waiver. Interestingly, the it bears uh, worth mentioning on this note that California and uh, other states can adopt the California st the standards through what's called the 177, and that's another section of the Clean Air Act. Um, but uh, California and the other section 177 states represent about 40 percent of the country. Um, however, in the remainder of the country, uh, the 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 standards that apply uh, would then be either the EPA standards or the EPCA fuel economy standards, and those two things uh, used to be joined at the hip, and uh, that's another uh, aspect that is uh, subject to review now, uh, and that's a topic for another podcast, perhaps. Uh, but uh, interestingly, because greenhouse gas emissions, the nature of greenhouse gas emissions, are such that you don't have a direct emission from the tailpipe to a localized environmental effect like you do in smog. Instead, the greenhouse gases uh, is are, are, are gases that actually mix uniformly across the atmosphere, uh, and therefore the environmental effects uh, that are asserted are as a result of the uh, ultimate changes in the climate, which might impact um, forest fires or flooding or the, or the like. Uh, but if you look at California's emissions in the aggregate, and this is a point that the petitioners make in their brief, uh, even if California's uh, emissions program is ratcheted down, if automakers are nevertheless able to average over the entirety of their vehicle fleets, including states that don't have those standards, uh, the whatever impacts are theorized from the California program, the other 177 states, you know, are arguably offset uh, by the emissions that could be uh, increased in other states. Regardless, all these types of issues go to this issue of whether or not California truly needs the uh, standard. In response, uh, the United States has asserted uh, many procedural arguments, and there is a long and, com and, and convoluted history as to how this waiver has been first denied, then during the Bush administration, then granted during the Obama administration, then it was rescinded during the Trump administration. Now it's being reinstated uh, during the Biden administration. And so while there are a host of what I'll call really int interesting intellectual issues that have been kicking around uh, for a very long time, uh, the United States in its brief is working very hard uh, to try to not reach uh, any of those issues. Uh, there are issues of standing that have been raised about the both constitutional standing as, uh, as well as the zone of interest, questions about EPA's own authority to reconsider its uh, previously granted waiver. It's always uh, a curious thing, of course, when the federal government uh, makes arguments uh, that it uh, is going to construe the, the the statute, that it lacks the power to do so, of course, do something. Of course, you know, the Trump administration did make uh, such arguments uh, uh, as it related to the Clean Power Plan uh, repeal uh, and uh, the major questions doctrine, uh, and ultimately did turn out to be uh, right in the Supreme Court. And so it's not unheard of, uh, but it is always uh, uh, interesting, uh, nevertheless, to see those types of arguments being made by uh, federal administrative agencies. So a uh, very, very interesting case. Uh, we, and we uh, that's kind of the background on where a lot of the major issues are. And I'm going to hand it off now to uh, my colleague here, Professor Percival, uh, to give his take on uh, some of these uh, arguments and where they may go. Yes, Professor. Any, please feel welcome to uh, chime in. Uh, and Jonathan, thank you so much for such a, such a comprehensive and impressive elucidation of these issues. Great. Um, I have to apologize first because I have a horrible cold for the last three days that has affected my uh, ability to speak. It's not COVID. I've done three negative COVID tests. But I just wanted to give sort of a, a larger background. Uh, and that is that uh, um, I've been teaching environmental law now for 36 years. And the California waiver provision of the Clean Air Act 
is what I would call a bedrock principle of environmental law. Um, I remember myself when I drove my car that was registered in Iowa out to California to go to law school at Stanford, facing a $600 penalty if I got it registered there because it wasn't compliant with the California standards. Uh, now for the last 10 years, I've been uh, driving fully electric vehicles and I totally love them. I bought my second one last summer. And so I'm completely enthralled with zero emissions vehicles. Um, this hey, case, how did yeah. you drive to Iowa in that thing? I have not driven to Iowa uh, in it yet. But it is convenient because when everyone says, oh, but you're, when you fly to all these places, you're harming the environment, I say, yeah, but uh, when I drive to work in Baltimore from Washington, D.C., I'm not contributing any pollution since I have a, a zero emissions vehicle. Um, but this case is strange. Well, first of all, let me just say, every time there's a major regulation adopted by EPA, there's going to be litigation. So it's only expected that everyone and their brother and sister would pile on and come up with reasons why the agency screwed up. It's contrary to law. And now after West Virginia versus EPA, uh, they're inventing new constitutional doctrines to feed on the major questions doctrine. Now the Supreme Court was willing to bite on that. And I think this is an excellent illustration of what I would call political litigation. The red states don't like what the blue states are doing, so they're challenging it. But what's strange is that what they're actually asking for is something that would constrain their choices more than they have now. Right now, all states are free if they want to adopt the California standards or to comply with the national standard that EPA has set. Uh, and what the states are arguing is, oh, but by letting California have a more strict standard, that's somehow harming us. I think the government actually has quite a good argument that there's a serious standing problem here because it's difficult to show how the red states have been hurt in any way other than their feelings might be hurt because California has been authorized to do something really cool and innovative that's been such a dramatic success uh, over the years. And the uh, argument that this somehow interferes with state sovereignty when it imposes no obligations on the state it doesn't displace any exercise of state police power. It simply says, you now have a choice because of section 177. It's not just California that gets to do this. It's any other state that wants to join them. And there's at least 13 states that have done so, including Maryland, where I teach, and Vermont, where I teach during the summer, both states that until just a few days ago had Republican governors, uh, but environmental protection is very popular in both of those states. So I think the standing arguments here are really uh, quite serious. The constitutional claim that somehow the equal footing doctrine and amalgam of other constitutional strands that you can weave together mean that it's uh, unconstitutional to grant California special treatment, I think sort of falls apart on its face. The statute itself, when it was ad adopted over a half century ago, said because California had the most serious air pollution problems in the country at the time, uh, and because California was the only state that had adopted its own auto emission standards that because the new national Clean Air Act regulations were going to uh, 
make a deal with automobile manufacturers that we're not going to subject you to having potentially 51 different state standards. Instead, you would have one uniform national standard or California standard. That was a reasonable compromise that preserved California sovereignty. I actually think the breathtaking consequences of the argument based on state sovereignty are such that California could have argued that if they had preempted their standards, that they were being singled out for disparate treatment because they would have had to roll back their existing state uh, vehicle emission standards. Uh, as the government points out in its brief, the Constitution has very few explicit guarantees of equal treatment among states. Um, there have to be uniform duties, impost and excises, a uniform national bankruptcy and naturalization provisions. But there's very little to suggest that there's some broad principle that requires it beyond these specific instances. And even if it did, it's hard, hard to know how you would determine what is disparate treatment, especially here when the standard that's adopted gives all states more choice. They can choose whether or not they want to adopt the California standards, and they simply haven't done so. Now, Jonathan made it sound like, well, we've gone back and forth and back and forth recently about these waivers. Um, the government points out in his brief that until recently, until the Bush and Trump administration, there were 75 waivers that were routinely granted. And it was only in 2008 when the Bush administration uh, tried to deny the California waiver over the advice of all Clean Air Act experts and EPA's own counsel. Uh, something that was quickly rescinded when the Obama administration took office. And in 2019, when the Trump administration did so, and now the Obama, the Biden administration has override that, written that, it, it's quite clear that there's a long history now of these waivers being granted to California and states, other states are permitted to uh, follow along, and they uh, have done so. Now, the argument that, well, California, uh, even if it did all these things, that's not going to solve the greenhouse gas problem. I get so tired of hearing this argument because it's the standard fossil fuel industry response to pick apart every little individual source of greenhouse gas emissions and say, oh, this in itself is not going to make a difference, so we shouldn't worry about it. Well, if we applied that to all sources of greenhouse gas emissions, then we wouldn't be doing anything about what is now generally becoming agreed is a global crisis. Um, as Chief Justice Roberts said about Justice Stevens' majority opinion in Massachusetts versus EPA, every little bit helps. And that is what the Biden administration has been trying uh, to do here. So um, I would suspect that um, um, this case is that I, I assume Judge Rao will vote for the petitioners in this case, but I doubt if Judge Millett or Childs will do so. So I suspect that the challenge will be rejected by the DC circuit. And I'm gonna stop there and conserve what's left of my voice. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, you know, it's very gracious of you to, uh, despite your ailment, uh, to uh, uh, you know, take part in uh, today's uh, uh, litigation update. So really appreciate that. Um, and uh, you know, before I wanna, before the, the professor very graciously has uh, shared with us his views on, um, uh, on on the various aspects of uh, these challenges, so um, it, it's sort of Jonathan's turn. 
But I wanted to start off with the issue of standing. Uh, Jonathan, any views on the standing issue that the professor mentioned before we dig a little deeper, uh, mainly with you in the hot seat, uh, about, uh, about, about the various other claims? Um, and we can go back and forth between Jonathan and the professor. I think it will be uh, uh, quite, uh, quite entertaining and, and, uh, and, and instructive. Um, turning over to you, Jonathan. Yeah, well, you know, so of course, the DC Circuit in particular has some um, curious standing precedents, and particularly in this area as it relates particularly to the this the statute and these statutes and this issue. So I do expect that the standing issue is one that the panel well, will take up uh, with the litigants and and will explore. And uh, you know they're the and uh, that in and of itself um, may present the necessary vehicle. I mean, I think one thing that I, I do uh, tend to agree with Bob is, is given the complexity of the issues here with the median DC circuit panel, um, you know, there's a good prospect that this one may have to go the way of the, uh, may end up going the way uh, uh, if the petitioners are ultimately successful of, of, of not succeeding in the first round. Um, but then of course, if you need to move on uh, to another round, you need, generally speaking, uh, the Supreme Court likes to see something more than record-based administrative review type um, debates. And so the standing questions that have been raised uh, could provide, uh, ironically, to the extent that the government succeeds on that, um, the vehicle that would allow this case to get up to the Supreme Court. Uh, similarly, I think that the discussion about the equal sovereignty of the states is another a very interesting issue uh, that could similarly serve as such a vehicle, just as the uh, major questions doctrine issue, uh, which uh, was in the, uh, the clean power plant case, uh, repeal case, uh, provided the necessary vehicle to get the case up to the Supreme Court. So a colleague of mine, uh, often refers to these types of issues as SCOTUS bait. So, um, so you know, uh, you know, be careful. I guess what you what you wish for. I mean, all, ultimately, uh, my 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 view would be that there certainly is standing, uh, particularly as as it relates to this to the to the red uh, to the red states. We'll call them uh, because you know you're dealing with a injury of the states as a political entity um, as it relates to other states. And they are, uh, they give a couple of examples in their brief, um, citing back to Supreme Court precedents uh, and kind of introducing, if you will, the parade of horribles of if, if Congress can do this and give California an effect of this special dispensation uh, to set standards and do so in a way that really impacts uh, the rest of the country, um, can Congress not, um, as they say, uh, and I'm just kind of reading from their brief here because, you know, th these are uh, their examples, but um, could it not imagine, uh, imagine a law allowing some states but not others to boycott Israel, CF Crosby v. National Foreign Trade Council, or a law permitting just one state to enact and enforce immigration laws, CF Arizona v. United States. So, you know, the, the U.S. response to that is, well, Commerce Clause, longstanding tradition of regulating commerce between the states and discrimination is OK. Well, you know, discrimination uh, is OK vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the citizenry. Uh, but when uh, but when you're dealing with issues of the states as states, as an effect of body of of, of co-equal um, sovereign, uh, at least in part, uh, um, uh, units within the, the broader federal government, that takes on a, a different a type of, of, uh, of, of implication. And so uh, it does seem to me that they have standing to complain about whether the Congress has 
uh, in effect, disenfranchised them or provided them uh, advantages. Um, and uh, to the extent, and uh, I, I do, but I can see that that's a, a, an interesting question that's been presented. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Professor, um, I, I wanted to uh, uh, pick back up where Jonathan sort of ended which is that uh, on the equal sovereignty issue, and we have, we have lots of other, we have more issues to discuss than we have time. So we have to, be a, um, uh, we, have, we have to steward our issues uh, properly. Um, on, the, on the equal sovereignty issue, an amicus brief that was filed last week um, mentioned uh, that, um, that the sort of uh, Shelby County related concerns uh, about you know discrimination uh, uh, discrimination of some states vis-a-vis -vis other states um, under the fifteenth amendment is different from commerce clause um, from um, you know discrimination uh, against some states vis-a-vis -vis other states where Congress's commerce power is concerned. Do you have any uh, 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 instinctive reactions to that um, that kind of an argument? It was Leah, Leah Littman's brief. Yeah, I no, I, I think that's that's right. That when Congress, the Voting Rights Act that was at issue in Shelby County, uh, involved Congress exercising its power to enforce the Fifteenth Amendment, and the Supreme Court's precedent has said that con congressional measures uh, have to be congruent and proportional to the evil that the, they're trying to remedy. And that gave the court license to say, uh, well, we don't think that the problem that the Voting Rights Act was initially um, trying to address by requiring these pre-clearance procedures exists anymore because there's been such a decline in racism. And before the ink was dry on the opinion, the states that prevailed in that case in the South were passing voter suppression laws right and left, which kind of proved that the Supreme Court's own empirical conclusion was inaccurate. But that's a far cry from the justification that's needed when you tailor Commerce Clause regulation where Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause is um, embedded right in uh, Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution. And so you don't, I, I don't think that is a very good precedent for this novel argument. And I have to say, you know, I forgot to mention, I was amused to see the major questions argument be brought in, I guess, uh, might be considered a legal malpractice these days if any lawyer doesn't met, mention major questions because it's kind of uh, the issue of the day. But I don't see how that applies here at all because it involves uh, the question of whether Congress expressly delegated to an agency this power. And you couldn't have more specific provisions in the Clean Air Act saying that the California waiver can be granted and in section 177 and other states can adopt the same standards that California have. So it's not really a question of did Congress give EPA the authority to do what it's done here. Jonathan, any reactions? I, I do think that this deployment of the major questions doctrine is a bit of a uh, uh, a, a, a change, and it would be would represent an expansion um, from where it was originally recognized. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the Supreme Court wouldn't be prepared in this context to go there and to do that. Um, Particularly given the age of the of the provision here in the passage of time, I mean, you know, essentially what we have here is a uh, a provision that has been uh, successful in the sense of 
California um, for the years of the when it was focused on conventional pollutants, you know, for a time um, had uh, standards that were in advance. Um, and in that sense, so it's been successful in the sense that we now have very, very clean automobiles as a general matter. The catalytic converter, the modern catalytic converter, uh, is a device of wonder in terms of its ability to eliminate most emissions. Um, and uh, and so uh, the reality is, though, at this point, the delta uh, between uh, the emissions of a modern catal catalytic converter uh, and even a zero emission vehicle, particularly when you consider the life cycle basis of emissions and you know which is an interesting kind of record issue that has been presented uh, across this suite of cases uh, because you know the you know bob makes reference to you know the the vehicle not polluting uh, of course uh, it the vehicle is not making emissions as it's driving on the road but the creation of batteries uh, and uh, and frankly, the fact that these are uh, heavier uh, vehicles all around, you know, there are emissions that occur uh, in other places uh, and uh, on the road to ultimately powering these vehicles in terms of extracting the minerals, creating the batteries and doing all these things. Um, maybe they aren't emissions in the United States. And so uh, that uh, and because they're not uh, where I'm driving my car. Uh, those emissions are of of less consequence to to, to some uh, folks, uh, but you know there are real serious debates about the difference in the total uh, life cycle pollution uh, among the vehicles, um, as well as you know um, concerns of environmental justice uh, having been raised, um, not even uh, not necessarily on kind of a localized basis, but on a uh, on an international or worldwide basis as to where these uh, emissions are ultimately occurring. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, do you have any thoughts on whether or not um, uh, the, you know, I mean, you've discussed the issues, but I just wanted to kind of dive in, dive into your, um, your own analyses uh, about the EPA's wa waiver and whether or not it's preempted by federal law, you know, your views on the, particularly as it pertains to the Clean Air Act and the EPCA, if, you, if you'd like to dive in, then I'll go to a question for Professor Percival that's come in. Uh, what, what's, what, what's the question, Sohan? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I, the, the fault is entirely mine. Um, is the EPA's waiver preempted by federal law? You know, the, uh, the, the main question, the, the, the main statutory question in this case. So, you know, there, uh, I, I do think if there were a judge, so, if there were a Judge Brightbill on the panel, how would Judge Brightbill um, come out? Well, or, or better yet, you know, if I, if I had my druthers, Justice Brightbill on the big court, how well, would that? Uh, or 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 a hypothetical Judge Brightbill that has filed a brief uh, before, obviously in the in the defense of the Trump administration rule, and I uh, wrote then, and I continue to write and believe what I wrote then, and I continue to believe that now uh, that the. Uh, that the California uh, GHG program uh, is uh, preempted, um, certainly under uh, under 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 the EPCA standard. Uh, it and then uh, as it relates to the the uh, the waiver issue, then um, you do have a, a interesting question of statutory interpretation in a provision that saw a lot of revision over the years and you kind of have things kind of bolted on uh, in various ways. I think I think that the the state petitioners have the right argument um, and um, and uh, and that it just does not make sense ultimately to read the 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 provision as requiring essentially a single waiver that grants the State of California, a, uh, a essentially a waiver then for all time for all standards. Um, it it doesn't make sense as as a as either. I think when you really parse the text as a textual basis, and it certainly doesn't make sense as kind of a policy basis when you consider that what what Congress was trying to do. Why even have to go back and get more waivers 
if it's fait accompli once you have the first waiver. And that's really the theory of the United States uh, that they've gone back to now uh, in, in their reconsideration of the waiver. So I do think that they uh, have uh, the, the petitioners have the best of both arguments on, on the preemption question. Um, and, uh, but as I said, you know, there's a lot of procedural history here and uh, it'll be interesting to see how some of those issues play out as well. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a question that's come in for uh, Professor um, uh, Percival is that, uh, you know, many people believe that uh, greenhouse gases and climactic issues um, differ in meaningful ways from traditional criteria regarding such as compelling and extraordinary conditions and and or um, and or um, um, you know congruent and proportional needs. Um, it seems to be that this question is talking about the about uh, city of Bernie kind of, city of Bernie versus Flores kind of Fourteenth Amendment congruent and proportionality issues and I guess the Fifteenth Amendment uh, equivalence as well. So the, so the focused question is, does Professor Percival, in fact, have a response to these arguments other than that, um, you know, uh, that they're, uh, 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 other than believing that they are, um, um, you know, uh, uh, tiresome old tropes. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using a euphemistic version of the question. But uh, uh, but just uh, professor, do you have any thoughts on 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 issues like that? Well, I I spent two weeks in California uh, this January, and if you tried to tell anyone from California that climate change has not created compelling and extraordinary conditions there, in light of the double whammy of wildfires, then extraordinary weather events that are causing landslides and widespread damage around the state, uh, I think uh, you wouldn't be very likely to persuade anyone about that. Um, and I don't think that the, the, uh, you, the Clean Air Act has evolved over time. And it's true back in 1970 when it was enacted, it didn't specifically refer to greenhouse gases. And when California wanted to start regulating them, uh, it was thought that the major way to do so would be through uh, looking at vehicles fuel economy. And that's when the argument arose that, oh, but that would be a violation of NHTSA's fuel economy standards. And, I think that was, it was settled in the lower co uh, courts. And then in Massachusetts versus EPA, that was really the acid test where the Supreme Court in 2007 uh, said that the Clean Air Act has evolved. Air pollutant can include greenhouse gases. And it actually sided with approval uh, the lower court decisions that had rejected the effort to say, that the fact that there were national fuel economy standards preempted states from adopting these. Uh, the Supreme Court has had, uh, in recent years, been very skeptical about preemption claims, as it should be, because the justices want to preserve uh, states' prerogatives. And here, that's why, you know, it'd be very interesting if this case went to Supreme Court, because uh, what the petitioners are essentially arguing is give us fewer choices of fuel economy standards uh, in the name of preserving our sovereignty. And that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but it's not really, Bob. It's not giving us few, few, future choices. It's, you know, you're going to, um, because the choice that they're being offered is merely the offer that their purportedly co-equal sovereign California ha has offered um, in a way that may be most advantageous for them as opposed to other states, of course. You know, and you know, I, I do think that there are really interesting constitutional questions raised about whether if if Congress 
starts to, to get into the business and is in more expansively um, has the power to be in the business of differentiating among states uh, and as states, uh, I, I, there was no argument that I saw in the brief of the United States, I didn't get through all the amicus briefs as to where that stopping point is, but I think that's one that needs to be answered. Now, as to the EPCA, EPCA statute, I have yet to see any answer in any brief that anyone's filed um, that wrestles with the fact that the code, the United States code, at least as it type, applies to titles 42 and 49, is not the law. Positive law are the statutes that were passed by Congress at this point in time. And if you actually go back and look at those statutes, you recognize that the language that those two district court opinions were hung upon failed to recognize that it was there because there was a specific phase out in the EPCA statute over time that Congress installed during which EPCA and the fuel economy standards could account for and were allowed to account for the fact that compliance with California uh, emission standards would impact negatively a fuel economy. And the Congress granted specific, specific authority to the NHTSA uh, to account for that uh, in their standards. And that authority was phased out over time, leaving what I think is the really unambiguous answer that NHTSA's EPCA uh, 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 fuel economy standards and, and the EPCA statute itself no longer has that authority and would af affirmatively be contrary to that statute now to consider the California emission standards uh, and uh, which the neither of those district court decisions and whatever that was 2006 um, saw that recognized that and uh, and so that question as a statutory matter remains and I think there's really only one clear answer to it. So, gentlemen, we are we are nearing our uh, you know uh, nearing the end of the session, um, and uh, uh, and uh, so I just I just wanted to end with a couple of global questions, two of which will be predictive. Handle them as you um, as as you as you um, uh, would elect. One is that uh, you know from a uh, from a, from a prediction standpoint, how do you think this case will play out in the end at the three judge panel and bank if it were to go in bank? Um, um, if you think it has like some likelihood of maybe going in bank and, and then if it goes up to the Supreme Court, that's the first question. Um, uh, another predictive question is how do you think this case will affect in the long run environmental law or the, or the federal administrative state? And the final question is, why do you think so many industry actors have weighed in on the federal government's and California's side? So um, since Jonathan just went, I'm happy to start with the professor and then um, we will, you know, we will take it from there. Thank you, professor and, and Jonathan. Yeah, okay, as I mentioned before, I think on this panel, Judge Charles is the uh, crucial vote. Uh, Rao will uh, vote for the petitioners. Uh, Millette will vote for the respondent. Uh, I suspect uh, Judge Charles will vote for the respondent as well. Uh, I, I don't know if they'll bother to take it on bank uh, because I don't think the on bank court would disagree with an opinion in EPA's favor. Uh, going up to Supreme Court, it, it depends on what their appetite is for venturing further. Uh, if um, I suspect actually Jonathan's right that it won't be dismissed on standing grounds because the panel will want to uh, reach the merits. Uh, if it goes up to the Supreme Court, I don't think the court's going to want to open a can of worms of new constitutional equal footing doctrine that would allow it to parse the fairness of every federal program uh, in the country. So uh, I think that's a great unknown as to what would happen uh, in the Supreme Court. Uh, and what's your final question? Um, oh, well, it was uh, related to it. What do you think the, well, maybe you've already answered it. How do you think this case will affect in the long run environmental law or the administrative state? 
And and the other question um, was, uh, why do you think so many industry actors have weighed in on the federal oh, government yeah. and California? Yeah, state? well, and that's uh, industry, the auto industry in general hated the Trump rollback of the California waiver uh, because they're all in on the EV revolution. They've made substantial investments. There's so much reliance interest economically in ha retaining the California waiver. And so the industry in general is getting with the global move towards electric vehicles. And they don't want to reduce the demand for them by having the California waiver rolled back. I mean, that was illustrated by the fact that California, after Trump rolled back, the waiver, uh, major automakers voluntarily agreed with California that they were going to follow the California standards, whether they're in effect or not. Jonathan? Uh, so in the in the prediction game, I... I the, be the best fair parlor game in Washington, right? Yeah, prediction. I mean, you know, in, look, in terms of the, in the, in terms of the prediction game, I don't have a reason to do a different analysis than Bob, you know, with the panel, but uh, one never knows. That's why we have judges and sometimes cases go one way or another uh, that you don't expect. But I think that the a conventional analysis would, would end up where Bob has ended up. You know, with respect to why so many industry, I, I think that question is frankly not that interesting. So I'm not going to answer it because I think the answer is really obvious, right? Um, the, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Um, these regulations have a very dramatic effect on markets into which many, uh, many, many companies are invested on one side or another. Uh, and so I think a lot of times when you're looking at these things, uh, it's not that difficult if you follow the investments and you follow uh, the, the financial incentives where and how uh, various industry uh, participants uh, come out on one side or the other of the equation. There are obviously a lot of uh, industry petitioners involved. There are uh, industry interveners. And I think that uh, trying to figure out how and why any particular one has intervened uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is a matter of, of following incentives. You know, I do think the more interesting question ultimately is the effect that this is all going to have uh, on uh, the automobile fleet and the people. Um, and the availability of new motor vehicles, the cost of new motor vehicles, and the cost and availability of, uh, of, of fuel or energy and other things to subsidize that. The automobile uh, is a wondrous mechanism of America and representation of freedom. Uh, and, uh, and as it allows great mobility in both business and in life and in transportation and vacation. Uh, and, uh, and so, it, uh, it's, I, I think, um, you know, uh, a more interesting question will be to, is ultimately what effect will all this have uh, on, the, on people and in particular people's ability uh, to drive and to have and to own an automobile, which is uh, a, uh, you know, uh, as, as American as apple pie, as the saying goes, so. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Professor. Uh, this has been a very illuminating and impressive, uh, excellent discussion. We really appreciate your time. Uh, and we, we thank the Federalist Society for um, their exertions and putting this uh, event together. And um, uh, with that, we shall adjourn today. Thanks, thank Sohan, and, and thank you to our experts again and for the audience for tuning in. If you're interested in finding more content like this, you can go on our website at regproject.org or follow us on any major social media platform at FedSocRTP to stay up to date. Thanks again, we are adjourned. <laughs>